Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Hi, everybody. In just a moment, we are going to hop into this episode with Mr. Dave R. And I am entitling this episode, Recovery Works Good, But It Works Slow. That's a direct quote from Dave, which you will hear him say about halfway or so through the episode. But on the front end of this uh, podcast today, I want to give some uh, recognitions and I want to catch up on some uh, listener feedback. Um, The recognition is like this. This episode is brought to you by Deborah uh, F.D., Don C., Tammy, and Kim. Deborah, FD, Don C., Tammy, and Kim all went to our website, soberspeak.com, clicked on the donate tab, and made a contribution. Thank you so much, so, so, so much, Deborah, FD, Don C., Tammy, and Kim. This episode is for you, as we could not do this without you, this being a listener-supported podcast. All right, so let's go into some uh, listener feedback here. Uh, We've gotten quite a bit of feedback. By the way, if you are inclined to write in with some listener feedback, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Uh, You can contact us at feedback, F-E-E-D, Feedback, excuse me, F-E-E-D-B-A-C-K. I guess most people know how to spell feedback, but just in case, feedback at SoberSpeak.com. Also, if you go to the website and you click on the Contact Us tab, there is a microphone there. You can click on that microphone and leave us a voicemail. But the first write-in that we have today is from F.D. out of Spain. F.D. says, my name is F.D., I am an alcoholic listening to your podcast as soon as they are available. They are my meeting in between meetings, unquote. I listen to Sober Speak first thing in the morning while I'm walking my puppy. That's great. I love to hear that. I added that part. Um, I always listen at sunrise. Sober Speak gets me started and and focused and in the right spirit. Uh, As I said, I begin my morning listening to your audios, and it keeps me in peace and keeps me connected to our community. Thank you, JM, and thank you, AA, and thank you, my sponsor, Santiago, who passed away six months ago after 20 years of sobriety. I miss him very much. Santiago was my sponsor, and one of his sponsors many years ago was a disciple of people that started AA with Bill W. Amazing link to the first founders of AA. Santiago was from New York, but returned to Spain many years ago to his family roots. He saved my life. He passed away due to meningitis. I moved two months ago to a new city with my wife and my six-year-old boy, The landing and adjusting to the new life has been harsh on me. Basically, I'm groupless and surviving on your podcast, reading AA literature, and being in contact with my former base group. Sorry for the long email. 
Anyway, thank you for your service. Keep up your good work. It matters for the people on the other side of the woods. <laughs> All the best, FD in Spain. Well, thank you so, so much, FD in Spain. We are so glad you wrote into us. We're glad that we, as Sober Speak here, can be a just a small part of your recovery. And uh, God bless you. Sorry to hear about your uh, sponsor, Santiago. Uh, um, anyway, um, once again, just thank you so much for writing in to us. We do appreciate it and keep in contact with us. Now we have a letter from Bjorn from Sweden. By the way, is this just a uh, stereotype or is every male person in Sweden named Bjorn? And you know what? Bjorn's probably thinking, I bet you every male person in the United States is named John. But nonetheless, <laughs> uh, Bjorn from Sweden writes in and he says, thank you for the inspiration. Finally got the balls to go back to meetings. God bless. Um, <laughs> I guess they have that terminology in Sweden as well as they have it in the United States. Uh, anyway, he says, please feel free to quote me. Can't stop listening to your pod. I laugh so hard. Don't remember. But when the guy who got by by the guy who got kidnapped by two hookers, <laughs> By the way, that is episode number 36, uh, the uh, name of the episode, just in case somebody else hasn't heard it, is Matt R., sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, and then he ends it with, holy crap, exclamation point, I almost soiled myself while listening to that episode. Keep up the great work. Peace, Bjorn from Sweden. Thank you, Bjorn from Sweden. This is John in the U.S. saying, keep up the listening. We do appreciate it. And once again, we're glad we can be a part of a small part of your recovery as well. John B. writes in from Seattle. He says, hello from Seattle. I'm assuming that's Seattle, Washington. I wanted to send you a note of thanks to you and your guest on the podcast. I have been listening for the latest uh, six to seven, oh, to the latest six to seven episodes of the last week, and I have been deeply moved. I've been sober about 10 years and have recently begun struggling to take that last step and really turn it over. Funny how long we can hold out. The stories your guests have shared show so clearly that the promises are a reality. The talk of the neighborhoods and the Texas accent bring me back to a time I have trouble remembering. Things were kind of uh, tough when I lived in Northwood Hills. Thanks again. Keep up the work, John B. And just for those of you who don't know, Northwood Hills is a uh, uh, an area uh, in the Dallas, uh, Texas uh, area. Nonetheless, thank you so much, John B., for writing in. We appreciate it. God bless you. Uh, keep in contact with us. Keep listening. And uh, the feedback is most, most appreciated. All right. So that is the recognitions, the listener feedback. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Dave and get this party started with his episode. Hey, everybody. We're going to hear from Mr. Dave R. today. And Dave has been sober since March 7th of 1985. As of when this podcast is being released, that is 33 years in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's great, Dave. Um, this is a wide-ranging interview. We're going to cover a lot of different topics. Uh, Dave uh, uh, starts it out by talking about the subject of forgiveness and how hard that uh, area of our life can be to grab hold of. Um, he's also going to talk about his friend Sonny and how his friend Sonny said, if you don't go to the reunion, I may drink. And that is part of what helped Dave to get started on his recovery. He also said something during this podcast that uh, I don't know if I had ever heard before. I may have. If I did, I forgot about it. But he said, I don't know if I was born an alcoholic, but when I drank, an alcoholic was born. 
He's going to talk about the pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization involved with alcoholism. And he said toward the end of his drinking, he did not know, quote, if he had any heart left. And I thought that was a great way to describe that. So uh, one other thing that he said that stood out to me, well, there was a lot of things, but this is one of the things I should say. He said, recovery works good, but it works slow. And I couldn't agree more. So enjoy this episode with Dave R. Thank y'all. Okay, everybody. So we are sitting here. I say we, I am sitting here with my friend, Mr. Dave R. You say hello, Dave. Hi. Hello. <laughs> All right. So Dave, generally speaking, we'll have people give their, introduce themselves and give their sobriety date on the front end of this thing. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, my friend? Hi, I'm Dave, alcoholic, and I've been kept sober since March 7th, 1985. And for that, I am very grateful. March 7th, 1985. That is a significant amount of time in the progress. So that's 30, what, 33 years? 33, yeah. Wow. Yes. Dave. Yes. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, very fortunate. So Dave and I have known each other off and on since probably what, we were talking about this beforehand, the mid-90s? Early 90s, mid-90s. Yeah. 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 We met here in the Dallas group at some uh, other, uh, at uh, actually something called the Georgetown group. Right. Uh, some of our listeners are from the Georgetown group. And uh, <laughs> so so I wanted to have Dave over and just talk about his story. Uh, uh, I'm sure ever since that time in 1985, it has been absolute smooth sailing. There's been nothing you, serious <laughs> you've had to do with yeah, it. Right. <laughs> yeah, no. My sobriety, yeah, no. My sobriety has been very... Typical of a lot of people I know, where that includes a lot of, a lot of joy and a lot of emotional pain as well. Sometimes, yeah, you know, a little so, of both. Yeah, yeah. It sounds just like uh, you know we have a couple of kids, just like having kids. You know, a lot of joy <laughs> and a lot of challenges at the same time. <laughs> I wouldn't trade it for anything, though, right? Right. Either sure. my kids, obviously, or sobriety. Um, mm-hmm. It's worth the uh, the trial and errors. So Dave and I were just getting a cup of coffee here before we sat down to make the recording, and uh, uh, we were just kind of jabbering back and forth, and uh, Dave mentioned something about uh, uh, a story he had heard. I, we started talking about forgiveness in general, really, is what mm-hmm. happened. And Dave, why don't you share what you were saying about forgiveness, what your thoughts on it are, and we'll open it up with that and kind of take it from there. Sure. Uh, yeah, we were when uh, before the the meeting here, and I were talking about forgiveness, and and I don't know about you, but um, God, when I got here, I was I was so unforgiving of everyone, including myself, and and I, you know, I was at a an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous the other night, and a guy was sharing his story. And he talked about an experience around forgiveness. And uh, that experience was that uh, there was a man here in the Dallas area that was a sober member of AA that was run over and killed by a drunk driver. Wow. And um, when that happened, the uh, drunk driver went to prison eventually. And the members of one of the of uh, an AA group here in town signed a big book and with all kinds of encouraging messages to this this man that ran over our dear friend and sent it the big book to him in prison and uh, Bob was sharing about that experience and about uh, their dear friend Ted and Bob was doing the steps this week at our group And he had the book that was sent to that inmate with him. He told the story that the inmate had passed away and the correctional facility had sent the book back to Bob. Wow. And uh, as he spoke on forgiveness, he read the notes that people wrote in that book to that uh, drunk driver. How much? And uh, for me, it was a very powerful experience. Uh, 
because I've always had such a hard time with forgiveness. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm unable to forgive without God in this program. I was never able to do it before. And without God in this program now, I just can't forgive myself or others. And I believe, you know, I just don't know. I don't, I, I love to hear about forgiveness because it's so important to me. And I think that, uh, I just can't hear enough about it. So do you want, would you like to share about any particular experiences you, you have had in your sobriety where forgiveness is part of the equation? Sure. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll share about my first resentment in Alcoholics Anonymous <laughs> as a sober member of AA. And, um, you know, it was a, when I was, oh, I was probably a couple years sober. I was working construction and I would do side jobs with uh, members of my crew. And one, one weekend we did a side job and my friend decided not to pay me. Oh, somebody in AA? For, no, it was somebody not in AA, but oh. somebody I worked with. And I'll give you a tip. Um, never try to steal from a thief. <laughs> you know, it's, it's insulting, right? And I was so mad at this guy. Um, you know, never mind how much I had stolen from others in the past, but I, how dare he, you know, and he even told me uh, one day, I'm sorry, Dave, but I got to rob Peter to pay Paul. Wow. And I was so upset and I had to work with this guy every day. And I just, I couldn't get over it and I couldn't get over it. And I finally talked to my sponsor about it. And he said, you know, he understood. And he said, well, Dave, um, when I have a resentment, I pray for that person. And uh, I, this is the first time I remember really hearing about praying for people who I resented. And I thought, oh, my God, that makes no sense at all. I mean, this is never, it'll never work. And I hate this guy. And I don't know about you. I've always understood, you know, anger and resentment better than love and forgiveness. I just, it just made more sense to me. But Ooh. now I know <laughs> I'm, I'm learning that I've got to live a different way. And I'm like, well, okay. I'll... And he pointed me back to a prayer in one of the stories in the big book. Hmm. And it's a prayer in the story, freedom from bondage. And I believe it's on page 552, but check me on that. In the fourth edition? In the fourth edition. And, uh, but check me on that. And it, it's a, it's this prayer towards the end of the story. And, uh, and I'll paraphrase. It says, if you have a resentment that you can't get rid of, pray for that person's health, prosperity, and happiness, and that they may receive everything you want for yourself. Mm -hmm. And do it for two weeks or whatever time it is. And, um, I started doing that because I, I couldn't stand the pain and I didn't want to drink. And it took me a lot longer than two weeks to get over that resentment, mm. but you know, it worked. <laughs> Eventually I could think about him and not hate him. And I think that's, to me, that's miraculous. That is, that's a miracle. So I know you're not from Texas originally, right? I, b I believe you moved right. here from California. So how'd you get to Texas? Well, I was, uh, I'm, I'm originally from Long Beach, California. You're right. And I was, um, well, at the time I was, uh, I'll, I'll start out, I'll tell you about the whole process. I was, I was about five years sober and I was living with my mom because I was doing so well. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I'm not one of those guys who like skyrocketed to, you know, CEO. sober CEO right. stardom, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, my, my sobriety has been, you know, just, uh, like a lot of other people, you know, very slow, you know, slow growth. And, uh, so I'm living with mom and I'm, and I'm just going to meetings and I'm singing the blues to my sponsor and my high school reunion came up my tenure. And, um, I had been kicked out of high school. So, 
you know, I didn't want to go. I mean, that, that makes no sense, right? Why would I go to my high school reunion if I was kicked out of high school? Why were you kicked out? Yeah, for theft. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they have no sense of humor no, in high no, school. No, they don't under they you know, and and they knew that you know God bless them. Um, they knew I was drinking and using. They had some idea, and I would drink on the way to school and come into class drunk and and other stuff. So um, I was I was on their radar, mm -hmm. and uh, one day they caught me stealing something out of the gym, and the uh, Long story short, the dean brought me in and said, do you want to go to school here? You know, he gave me a chance. Mm -hmm. You know, people have been trying to give me chances my whole life. Good point. And um, I just sat mute. I didn't respond. And they they kicked me out. And they should have. Right they should have. So. Yeah, they should have. Uh, anyways, so back to how I got to Texas. So I'm... I'm uh, I was looking for work at the time and I was down at city hall and I ran into a girl I went to high school with and she said something like, Hey Dave, are you going to the high school reunion? And I would, you know, I didn't want to hear it. I was like, I don't know, you know, I don't know, which means by the way, when an alcoholic says, I don't know, <laughs> that means no, they're, they're just trying to avoid you. Right. And, uh, I really, I just didn't want to go to this thing and, then, um, a little while later, a buddy of mine that I went to high school with came into AA. Mm. He got sober. His name's Sonny. And um, Sonny started bugging me about it, you know, asking me, Dave, are you going to the high school reunion? Right? And I'm like, I don't know, Sonny. <laughs> you know, leave me alone. I'm not. Uh. Uh, then one day he said the magic words to me. He said something like, hey, Dave, are you going to the high school reunion? I don't know, Sonny. And he said, well, you know, I'm afraid if I go alone, I might drink. Mm. Now I got to go to the gosh dang thing, right? I mean, if he said that, you know, now I've got to go. So now I'm, I feel like I'm locked in and I'm like, oh, God. So um, I just, you know, I, I felt like I didn't have any clothes to wear. I felt embarrassed, you know. You know, I couldn't wait to get to my high school reunion and see all my successful friends and tell them I was living with mom. <laughs> right. You know, I just couldn't wait. Right. And I knew I'd be, it was going to be a miserable experience, but now I'm, I had to go. So, and I received some encouragement from other people as well. You know, my mom encouraged me to go. Uh, I think my sponsor encouraged me to go. And, and so I went and guess what happened? I had a great time. People were glad to see me. You know, some of them couldn't believe it. Right? <laughs> right. They're like, why? You know, and uh, I just had a ball just like you people told me. Yeah. Right. And you guys have been telling me that through my whole sobriety. Just, just show up. Did they have, did they ask you if you had that item you stole from the gym? Yeah. Right. <laughs> 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 Actually, the guy who, there was someone else who was involved and he's actually uh, might have been there. I forget. But anyways, I'll go and I'll, I'll forget about that. But I digress. Yeah, I digress. <laughs> I've got a funny story about that, too, but maybe another time. Anyway, so um, long story short, a, a guy I went to school with comes up to me. And he says something like, hey, Dave, you look great. You know, like he couldn't believe it. Mm. Right. Like, you know, the last time I saw you, you look like hell. <laughs> I can't even believe you're here. And uh, he said, hey, you know, we we've got this little software company. Do you want a temporary job? And I'm, you know, so I'm looking for work. I'm, you know, living with mom and I'm miserable. And my first thought is, no. Why would I do that? I mean, I'm, I've never turned on a computer. I'm a truck driver. That makes no sense at all. Right. So I, I kind of, I tried, I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't agree to it. And I, you know, I've made some mistakes in my sobriety and, and let me tell you, if anything ever, like this ever happens to you, 
don't make the mistake of telling your sponsor or your mom <laughs> because they're going to do stuff like encourage you and tell you, wow, that's great. You ought to try. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, I took the job. And that would have been around, what, 1990 or so? That was so? 1990. Mm-hmm. October 90. And how long have you been working that job, Mr. Dave? In in October, this October, I'll be there 28 years. Wow. As 28 years. 28 years. I have a hard time with 28 days or 28 months, right? But right. 28 years is absolutely fantastic. And, you know, to me, and, and I do know you personally, uh, um, that is um, that... Uh, that's similar to what your personality is like. And I mean that in a complimentary way and in a similar to what your recovery has been like, because I've seen you just slow and steady and consistent and, uh, able to pass it on, uh, being a good example. And, uh, that's fantastic, Dave. It really is. Well, thank you. And it's, it's really, to me, it's just an example of, you know, uh, God, as I understand him and Alcoholics Anonymous is the reason that happened to me because without, without this program, I mean, I never go to my high school reunion. Right. <laughs> right. I never even go. Right. So, wow. Uh, Change the whole path of my life. God works in mysterious ways, his duties to perform as they say. Yes, sir. All right, so let's go a little bit more into your story. So obviously there was something that got you into Alcoholics Anonymous. I, do you want to give a, a brief history of, you know, what, what it was like for you, so to speak, or what you were like, I should say? Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I was, well, you know, I, I grew up in Long Beach, and um, I was, uh, you know, my my family, I don't know about anybody else, but we were, you know, we, my, my dad, and my uncle drank, drank beer and they would drink, uh, they used to drink Coors. Remember that in the mm-hmm. gold can? Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing those cans around the house and I remember, you know, getting a sip of beer off of that at a very young age. I don't know how young I was, but very young and nothing ever bad happened to me. I mean, it was, it was, a you know, uh, parties and beer at that time were a good thing in my family. And, um, and, but, uh, you know, at that time I didn't know I was, you know, an alcoholic, right. And I didn't know what an alcoholic was, but, you know, as I got older, um, oh, I, by the way, I was a, I was a vandal. Any vandals? Yeah. Hey, that, yeah. Right, right here, here. Yeah. yeah I was, mine. I was one of those kids that I, I don't know. What's that all about? But, I think it's yeah. anger coming out, <laughs> and, you know, is. anger and attention. And I don't know what it's all about. What is but. it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, me and my little friends, we used to run around and tear things up right. and it was the excitement and some anger and whatever. And, and I love to be chased. Yeah. You know, yeah. I still drive down the street with my wife when she's in the car and I'll look at somebody's yard and I'll say, Hey, do you think about stealing that stuff or tearing it up by any <laughs> chance? And she's like, well, no. And I'm like, well, me neither. I just, I just <laughs> yeah. wanted to check. I just, I'm just checking. Right. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Well, uh, oh, one time I got a hold of this, one of those big black crayons. You remember those carpenters crayons oh, or whatever? Yeah, yeah. And I thought, I'm going to write on something. Like graffiti. So like a graffiti thing, yeah. but you know, and, and so I'm walking down the alley and I find this beautiful stucco wall. You know, there's a lot of stucco out there mm-hmm. and I'm standing in front of this wall and I can't think of what to write. <laughs> your your I, creative I, juices I, were blocked. I, I was kind of blocked. I didn't know. So Writer's block. It was writer's block. So I wrote my phone number. <laughs> that's not a good <laughs> idea, Dave. That is, that's, that's what came to you. Right. That's what came to all all right. about us. I've never been the right. sharpest. You know, like you think a lot of yeah. hot women are going to come look at yeah. that <laughs> number and call you, right? It's I the, just, I yes, right. <laughs> And I got in a lot of trouble for that one. Um, and I was just a mischievous kid. And uh, so back to drinking. One day, I went over to a friend's house, and his 
his parents had an alcohol cabinet or a you know liquor cabinet, and we got into that liquor. I was very young. How and old? I was probably twelve or thirteen, and um, we started drinking. And gosh, you know, the, I started drinking this brown liquor. I don't know what it was. And the end of this story is pretty obvious. I got drunk and sick and in a lot of trouble. And uh, from that point on, that's all I could think about mm-hmm. was doing that again. You know, I uh, someone used to say, you know, I don't know if I was born alcoholic but when I took a drink, an alcoholic was born. Mm. And that's what happened to me. It was just like pouring gasoline on a fire. And uh, I'm one of those uh, alcoholics that goes to any lengths to drink. Now I go to any lengths to stay sober. Mm. But then I went to any lengths to drink. And I was one of those kids that, uh, you know, look out. Don't leave your garage open with beer in it. <laughs> right. Because I might get it. Or don't leave the tools in the back of your truck because I might get those and sell them for uh, beer. Right. Aren't you glad we grew up in an age where they didn't have all these video cameras all around? Thank God. I'd have never made it. I'd have never made it. I'd be in jail now. And, uh, you know, I'm not proud of that, but that's what I did. That's my story. And um, so a little more history. My parents used to take us used to take us to Mexico on vacation mm-hmm. and we'd go, we'd go down to Baja uh, on the way to Ensenada. And now I'm, I'm, I'm drinking more. I'm going to any lengths to drink. And, um, what I love going down, you know, I love going down there because they would, my parents would let me drink down there. And to me, it was like heaven. Mm-hmm. And we used to drink those Tecate beers. You mm-hmm. remember those? Mm-hmm. And, so one morning, just to give you an idea of how the progression of my disease, you know, I was a teenage alcoholic. Okay, so one morning. It sounds like I was a teenage werewolf. Yeah, something. right. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. I had more hair back then. So I had, <laughs> right. And uh, long story short, I'm, I'm standing in the kitchen of this hotel place we were staying at, and it's four in the morning, and I'm drinking a beer. And uh, my dad walks in, and he asks me, what are you doing? And I said, uh, I'm finishing my beer. <laughs> and, you know, he kind of, he looked at me funny, like, you know, a dog looks at you when they don't understand what you're doing. He walked over to me, gently grabbed my arm, and walked me over to the sink and poured it out. And he said, see, it pours. And it never occurred to me to do that. And that's why I believe that I have that phenomenon of craving that the book talks about. And I had it then. And uh, if I were to pick up a drink today, it would return in full force. No doubt. No doubt. So let me read a little uh, mid-tro announcement here. We will be continuing our conversation with Mr. Dave R. in a moment. Just a reminder, you are listening to Sober Speak You can find us on the World Wide Web at www.soberspeak.com. There you will find 40 plus other episodes you can listen to for free. You can also find the donate button on our website, which you can use if the spirit moves you to do such. Please keep in mind, this podcast is funded by you, the listener. Sober Speak is a self-supporting organization through our own contributions. We are not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. We do not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorse nor oppose any causes. Now, back to Mr. Dave R. Okay, so where are you in the story now? Let's let's get us up more toward uh, coming into the program, getting sure, into some of your recovery. Sure. So at the end of my drinking... Um, I was living with my dad, and so now I'm 23 years old, and I'm, I'm you know, I have to be taken care of. Um, um, I'd run away from home um, after I got, you know, I'd gone to treatment, um, uh, kicked out of high school, gone to treatment, run away from home, 
And from that point until I was about 23 years old, I, I tried to live on my own, you know, and, and tried, you know, you know, gave it my best shot and I could not live and drink successfully. I tried, you know, I tried, I tried to live my life like the movies, right? You drink, Mm -hmm. you know, you drink a little, fight a little, get the pretty girl in the end, right? (laughs) Isn't that how it goes? I think. But my life didn't turn <laughs> out that way. Heard. Yeah, <laughs> okay. me neither. You know, I just, my life turned into a, a just a, the end of my life, it was just kind of pathetic. You know, I was just living with my dad, digging for change in the couch because <laughs> I couldn't support myself, you know, and drinking when I could. And I was miserable. And at that time, you know, in the big book, it's described as pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization, that feeling we get, that we all get, mm-hmm. you know, wherever we come from, right? But all I knew at that time when I thought it was, thought about it was I just didn't have any heart left, you know? I was just miserable and life was a drag. What do you mean by you didn't have any heart left? I don't think I've heard it put that way before. Um, I didn't have any heart to go out and and uh, live life. I was afraid all the time. I was uh, I felt horrible about myself. I had all these big secrets and uh, all that uh, braggadocious behavior and all that, you know. Um, I was, I was, at one point I was, I was a guy with a a big ego with nothing to back it up, you know, (laughs) and I couldn't even do that anymore. I was just, I just felt, I just didn't have any heart left. And the fire was burning low. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, one day I'm sitting at my dad's and an old buddy of mine came over. Old brother Bob C. And he was like an older brother to me. I love Bob. He was such a, he's always very kind to me. And, and, uh, he kind of looked like Dr. John. Remember that piano player? He's kind of a big, jolly guy, big beard, just a really, you know, and, uh, he came over and he was like 60 days sober and, and in a program. And he asked me to go to a meeting with him, you know, and, uh, he, he talked me into it and me, his brother, and we picked up a lady somewhere. I don't remember. He was driving. And uh, he took me to a meeting. And I've been sober ever since. Mm. You know, I didn't know what was happening to me. Uh, I believe I know what happened today. And uh, God bless Bob. You know, I'm still here and he's gone. I don't know how that works, but. Uh, Did he die? Yeah, sober? dear Bob, dear Bob. uh uh, took his own life. Oh, wow. And uh, a couple years later. Wow. And it uh, could have been me. Could have been me. Yeah. Talk about that. I mean, was that, it, I mean, good to uh, walk me yeah, through that time. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, when uh, Bob had stopped going to meetings, and uh, I eventually started going to meetings on a regular basis. I didn't in the beginning. I wanted to, I... I, for about a nine month period, I stayed dry, just staying busy. And, uh, but once I started going to meetings, I really, you know, I heard that Bob was living downtown Long Beach with a bunch of crazy people. And, um, so I went to see him one morning. Uh, I, w- I was trying to 12 step him. And, um, I remember walking into his apartment and all the lights were on. This was, I was at, At this time, I was a truck driver. I hadn't gotten that job yet. And so I would get up early, and I remember walking into that apartment, and nobody was there. I thought, hmm, they all must be out somewhere. And I walked into his little bedroom, and I found like a recovery book. I think it was a 24-hour book. And I opened the book, and I put it on his bed. You know, I thought... That was my attempt to send a message to him. And and I turned around and I walked out. And um, on the way out, I noticed a door to like an attic. It was a second story thing. But I didn't I didn't look in there. And I left. And uh, it turns out that Bob was in there. Oh, my goodness. 
he'd he'd hung himself from the rafter and uh i just didn't look i don't know why and somebody found him the next morning wow yeah it could have been me God never knows, or we never know who's going to pass us that message. And uh, my goodness, God bless his soul. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, all right. So let's move up to recovery here. So let we'll talk about maybe your first meeting coming into AA and your experience with that. My first meeting is it's it's foggy. I went with Bob and. I don't remember much of that first meeting. It was uh, on Clark Avenue in Long Beach. Um, and uh, I remember another meeting after that, and it was at a, a hospital. And there was some guy standing at a podium telling a story. And he was talking about losing his job after 30 years of drinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, I identified with that guy. I thought, hmm, he was a, uh, he talked about drinking. And I thought, he's my kind of guy. And, uh, and then, like I mentioned before, I, I stopped going to meetings for a few months. And because I, I thought I could do it on my own. Um, I didn't drink, but, uh, or use any drugs. But uh, I just tried to do it on my own. I hadn't really taken the first step yet. And uh, I was doing what I like to call Dave's program of recovery. <laughs> right? And that consists of working and fishing. <laughs> and I even had a bumper sticker on my truck at one point that said, when the going gets tough, the tough go fishing. Right? Right. And, and I, and, you know, I don't know about you, but... If I'm not drinking and I don't have a program of recovery, this emotional pain starts to build up slowly but surely. And eventually, I've got to do something. I'm going to drink again or I'm going to freak out or I'm going to, you know. And I was driven back to AA because of uh, because I hit an emotional bottom. Talk about that emotional bottom. What that look like? Um at the end of about a nine month period, I was so miserable that I, I just couldn't be grateful for anything. I couldn't, I just hated, I just hated, you know, being in my own skin. And I didn't realize that I need a program of recovery, uh, to live a good life without it. I'm just not, I just can't be whole. You know, I believe God, as I understand him, wants us, wants me to be whole. And without this, this beautiful program, I just can't even approach uh, becoming a whole person. So it's always hard to wrap up what 33 years we talk about mm -hmm. in sobriety mm -hmm. in a few minutes on a podcast, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But, you know, I know, like all of us, right, if you've been sober for any extended period of time, you've been through ups and downs and mm -hmm. talk to me about, give me a thumbnail sketch, if you will, of your 33 years in sobriety and, and what you want to highlight there and what you want the listeners to know. Well, you know, my recovery has been works good but it works slow i've i've my my experience has been that um uh sobriety is a wonderful thing but there have been some painful times in my recovery um and you know i i around forgiveness for one you know and without this program i like I said earlier, I, I don't have the power to forgive myself or others. I've had uh, emotional pain in my sobriety that without God, this program and a sponsor, I could not have gotten through. I really believe that. Um, you know, the book in the, in the 12 and 12, which is one of my favorite books, 
Uh, I believe it's the seventh step talks about, you know, Bill writes, for us, the process of gaining a new perspective was unbelievably painful. Mm -hmm. And I've experienced that in my recovery. And, but I've gotten through these times so far with your help, right? With God and AA, I believe I can go through anything. And, um, but it's not easy for me. The programs, is, like you say, it's simple, not easy. And, uh, but for me, the, the results have been huge because, um, my life has never, it's never been, uh, so good. Um, just recently I went on this great vacation, uh, with my girlfriend. Back, Where'd you go? Back to Long Beach, California. Oh, Long Beach, where it all started. Where it all started. And when I, when I go back, I like to take a tour. You know, and, you know, I pointed out to her, you know, here's where I got arrested. <laughs> here's where I threw up, you know, all the important events. And uh, now when I go back, I mean, I, we, you know, I go to meetings. I see my parents. I see my brother and my niece. Um, and I can enjoy life today. I can enjoy life better than I've ever been able to enjoy it before. Um we went to Catalina Island and on a zip line trip oh. and I'd never gone zip lining before. And I'll tell you, stepping off that platform for the first time was, um, I was scared. I could feel it, you know, even though I know it's completely safe and you know what, but for me, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, you guys have shown me, man, just give it all you got. You know, when, when, when times are good, enjoy every second of it and just and, and enjoy every minute. And when times are tough, just, you got to hang in there, use all the tools and your friends and you can get through it. Right. Just live life. Yes, sir. Yeah. One day at a time. So to kind of, uh, uh, start to wrap it up here. Is there anything in particular that we've missed that you want to add, uh, and make sure the listeners know about, you don't have to add anything. I just want to make sure we don't miss something here. Um, no, I think, um, I believe that, uh, I, I really, I'm really glad we focused on forgiveness mm -hmm. because that's such an important, uh, topic for me. Uh, I believe if I can conti continue to forgive myself and others, I'm going to stay sober and I'm going to have a good life. I agree, my friend. And sometimes, you know, a lot of times, as you know, at least here in our area, we say the Lord's Prayer. I know a lot of places do at the end of that meeting, at the end of the meeting. And it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And uh, I guess the idea is there that uh, if God can look down on me and forgive me of my shortcomings and all the crap that I've done throughout my life, uh, in theory, I should be able to give forgive somebody else. But sometimes it's tough. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's much easier said than done. Mm -hmm. But that's the goal. And that's what to work toward. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you, Dave. Man, I really appreciate it. This has been uh, powerful. Um, I want to go ahead and close it up here with uh, um, a little uh, reading from the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, once again, you can reach out to us if you'd like to. Uh, contact us at feedback at soberspeak.com. And if you go to the Contact Us tab on soberspeak.com, there is a microphone icon that says leave a message. You can actually leave a voicemail for us if you would like. Um, and I'm going to read from page 164 of the big book to close us out here. And on page 164, and by the way, just in case you don't know what the big book is, that is the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and the last two paragraphs say, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. 
Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Once again, Mr. Dave, thank you so much for stopping by and uh, being with us today. Thank you, John. I really enjoyed it. You're welcome. Bye-bye.